はい、皆さん、おはようございます。えー、リンク J のライブウェイナーにご参加いただきまして、誠にありがとうございます。今日はですね、リンク J&UC サンディエゴジョイントウェビナーシリーズの第11回目です。えー、神戸大学とですね、えー、細胞内シグナル、伝達と脂質研究。えー、そのセッション2をですね、えー、お送りいたします。えー、神経及び、えー、脳機能に関する最新の研究を、えー、語っていただくという会になっております。えー、私はリンクジョージ・オムリジョをやっております、曽山と申します。内藤とよろしくお願いいたします。今日はですね、えー、画面にお示しているプログラムに沿って進めてまいります。えー、ご質問はですね、ウェビナーの、えー、Q&A 機能。えこちらからお願いをいたします。えー、時間の都合でですね、すべての、えー、質問にお答えできかねる、えー、場合がございますが、ご容赦をお願います、えー。またですね、このイベントではですね、ウェビナーの同日通訳機能、えー、英語字幕、えー、をご利用いただきます、えー。字幕はですね、市販されているアプリを使用しております関係上、えー、リンクで UC サンディエゴ校、えー、神戸大学は語訳とか訳文の欠落と、えー、字幕に関する責任は、えー、追いかねますので、この点ご了承をお願いいたします。えー、またですね、ホームウェビナーの、えー、録画、えー、録音や画面キャプチャー、こちらは、えー、固くお断りしておりますので、よろしくお願いいたします。えー、最後になりますが、えー、ウェビナー終了後に表示されるリンク、えー、こちらからですね、アンケート、えー、のフォームにお進みいただきますのでですね、ぜひ皆様のご意見、ご感想をお聞かせください。えー、皆さんのお役に立つウェブセミナーを今後も開催していきたく、ご協力のほどよろしくお願いいたします。えー、それではですね、今日はですね、えー、いつもとちょっと違うところがございます。えー、UC サンディエゴ校のキャンパス内、えー、にあるですね、フランクリン・アントニオ・ホール。えー、こちら、えー、昨年秋に、えー、できたばかりの、えー、建物、えー、コラボレーションの、えー、研究棟なんですけれども、えー、そこにですね、開設いたしましたリンク J のミーティングルーム、えー、がございます、えー。こちらからご登壇をいただいている、えー、UC サンディエゴ校オフィス・オブ・リサーチ・アフェアーズの国際アウトリーチシニアディレクターの和賀さんからですね、えー、イントロダクションとモデレーターのご紹介をお願いします。和賀さんよろしくお願いします。はい、おはようございます。UC サンディエゴの和賀でございます。えー、今日はあの後ろの,あのバックグラウンドをご覧になってわかる通り、えー、リンク J さんの名前を冠した、えー、ミーティングルームから参加しております。えー、こちらは、えー、工学部の中に昨年できました大型の、えー、研究、えー、棟があるんですけれども、その中の1階に、えー、リンク J さんのミーティングルームがあります。えー、と UC サンディエゴとコラボレーションをされたい方、もろもろの,あそうです、ね、あのパートナーシップを結びたい方、えー、リンク J さんのメンバーであれば、こちらの方をあの使うことができますので、ぜひあのお気軽にあのご利用なさってください。え今日は、えー、UC サンディエゴとリンク J さんのジョイントウェビナー with 神戸大学さんということで、えー、セッション2回目になります、えー。まず最初に神戸大学の白井先生の方から、えー、っと簡単なご挨拶をいただき、その後 UC サンディエゴのえー、バイデンせん、えー、とブーディン先生の方からご挨拶並びに最初のスピーカーのご紹介をいただきます。では白井先生よろしくお願いします。はいありがとうございます。Thank you very much.、Uh, おはようございます。Uh, good morning for the audience in Japan and、uh, good afternoon from USA. My name is Yasuhito Shirai from Kobe University. And、uh, today,、uh, with Itai,、uh, I will be chair of the, this session. So, you know, UC San Diego and the Kobe University have been a, a nice collaborator、uh, over years in the field of life science.、Uh, today, two professors will discuss the structure and the dynamics of the ligand gated ion channels in the neuron membranes and the role of the lipid related enzyme. Uh, in higher brain function. So I hope you will enjoy、uh, today's session. So, Itai, could you start your session? Yes.、Um, good morning to all our friends、uh, in Kobe University and、uh, across Japan. And、uh, it's my real pleasure to、um, uh, introduce our, our first speaker today,、um, Professor Ryan Hibbs. Uh, in neurosciences here at UC San Diego.、Um, Ryan、uh, actually just moved to UC San Diego from University of Texas、uh, Health Sciences System,、uh, where he worked for 10 years and、uh, established his lab as leaders in understanding the structure and function of proteins that are really central to、um, 
synaptic function and function of our brains. So Ryan has won many awards for his research, including the Hackerman Award in Chemical Research, the Klingenstein Simons Award in, in Neuroscience, uh, and a McKnight Scholar Award. He has also received an outstanding alumni award here from UC San Diego because he uh, did his PhD uh, with Palmer Taylor uh, in pharmacology. So we are really happy to have him back and have him to share his research uh, with you all as part of this webinar series. Okay, thank you very much, Ite, for the kind introduction and to all of the organizers for the invitation to speak in this webinar series. I am honored to be here and participating, and I am excited to share some of my recent work uh, with you today. So my lab focuses on the structural biology and physiology of ligand-gated ion channels, and there are, uh, there's a family of them that we study. They are pentameric ligand-gated ion channels, and we do a lot of structural pharmacology using structural biology to understand drug mechanism. And so I will start today by introducing the family of ion channels that we're studying, uh, the different members of the family and what they do in the body and the brain. And then I will focus in on the GABA-A receptor, which is shown on this title slide here. This is an electron microscopy map of the receptor, a structure we determined. And we'll focus on the question about how do general anesthetics work to dampen neuronal activity and cause a loss of consciousness? It's a question that has mystified uh, biologists and non-scientists for centuries. So the structure I'll focus on today is with propofol bound. So propofol is a is the most commonly used intravenous anesthetic, and we found that it binds deep in the membrane in a site that otherwise would be occupied by lipids um, buried in the membrane here at the interface of subunits in the receptor. So what is this family of ion channels that we are working on? So they are pentameric ligand-gated ion channels. There are two halves of this family. One half has an ion channel that is selective for cations, and those include nicotinic acetylcholine receptors, and 5-HT3 type serotonin receptors. On the other side of the family are the anion selective channels. And these are members activated by neurotransmitters GABA and glycine. The cation selective members are permeable to sodium, potassium, and some lead through calcium. And they always play excitatory roles in uh, neurotransmission. The anion selective members are permeable to chloride, the most abundant biological anion, and they typically play inhibitory roles in signaling in the brain. <clears throat> Regardless of the pharmacology and the ion channel properties, all of these receptors share a common architecture. They are all pentameric receptors. They can assemble from five identical subunits or different combinations of subunits, which gives rise to tremendous diversity in signaling necessary for the function of the human brain. Regardless of the subunit identities and stoichiometry, each one of the subunits shares a conserved membrane topology. So each one of the five subunits has a large extracellular amino terminal domain, which contributes to forming the binding site for the neurotransmitters in the upper row of the slide. Neurotransmitters bind at interfaces of subunits in this extracellular domain sticking out into the synapse. Each subunit also has four transmembrane spanning alpha helices. The second one is the one that lines the ion channel and determines whether the channel is permeable to cations versus anions. My laboratory over the past 10 years has focused on two members of this superfamily, one cation selective member, nicotinic acetylcholine receptors, and one anion selective member, GABA A receptors. And we chose these because they're very abundant, they're particularly well characterized in terms of their pharmacology, and there are many different subtypes. So I'll give you a couple of examples of projects across this family, these two families we've worked on. Nicotinic acetylcholine receptors, here are just two examples. 
a subunit assembly of alpha-4 and beta-2 subunits. This is the most abundant nicotinic receptor subtype in the human brain, and this receptor constitutes the high affinity binding site for nicotine. If you knock out the subunits, rodents will no longer self-administer nicotine, and so we've done structural work on uh, nicotine as well as partial agonists that are efficacious in uh, treating nicotine addiction. The alpha-3, beta-4 subtype nicotinic receptor is found in the peripheral nervous system at autonomic ganglia, where it mediates classical fast synaptic uh, signaling. Um, but it's also found in the brain in regions important for addiction and reward. And we were able to obtain structures of this receptor with a neurotransmitter bound as well as nicotine and a compound that is efficacious against addiction broad forms of addiction, including against opioids, amphetamines, and ethanol. <clears throat> on the other side of the family are the GABA-A receptors, and we've done a lot of work on a subunit assembly that has alpha, beta, and gamma subunits in it. This is the most abundant assembly found at synapses in the brain. It is found at about 30% of synapses in the human brain, very important in mediating inhibition in the brain. Uh, we've done a lot of structural pharmacology as well as trying to understand how uh, antibodies that are that are present in patients with autoimmune diseases cause those diseases. So today I will focus on the GABA-A receptor and a structural pharmacology project looking at how general anesthetics work. And so I'll spend the next couple of minutes talking about general anesthesia and why I think it is so important and so interesting to try to understand. So I would like you to consider what it was like to get surgery before the advent of effective general anesthetics. It was an awful, terrifying experience for the patient. And I usually focus, many people usually focus on the patient's experience here, but I would also like you to consider the position of the surgeon the chances that the surgeon are, is going to be successful are basically zero here. The patient is thrashing around. The surgeon does not have a calm, controlled environment where they can see what they're doing. If you contrast that situation with what happens in a more modern uh, surgical theater in the presence of a general anesthetic, it's a completely different scenario that I think we can all agree would be much more desirable. And so this is a painting illustrating the first operation under ether. It was the first public demonstration of a successful application of a general anesthetic. And here we have the first dean of Harvard Medical School removing a cyst from the neck of this patient. And if we go back here, we have the anesthesiologist holding a bottle of ether that is being used to keep this patient unconscious. The patient will have no memory of the procedure, they will not feel any pain during the procedure, and the, physici the physician will get to take their time and do a careful job. So this is why general anesthetics are so important. And there has been a lot of debate historically, over 100 years of debate, about how general, anesth how general anesthetics do what they do. Initially, the hypothesis was that they acted through an indirect, indirect effect on the lipid bilayer. And that idea was very popular because the potency of general anesthetics correlates very well with their partitioning into the lipid phase or the oil phase versus water. But that mechanistic idea started to fall apart with the advent of uh, the observation that different stereochemistry in general anesthetics can give rise to completely opposite activities, which suggested that general anesthetics are likely interacting with a protein, a chiral molecule, and not the lipid bilayer. And now we know that the main targets for general anesthetics are ion channels. And specifically, the intravenous anesthetics and many of the inhalational anesthetics act as positive allosteric modulators of GABA-A receptors. The general trend here with general anesthetics is that they potentiate inhibitory channels like GABA and glycine receptors, and they inhibit excitatory channels like nicotinic receptors and NMDA receptors. And the overall effect is a dampening of neuronal activity in the brain and a loss of, which gives rise to a loss of consciousness. <clears throat> 
So I will focus today for the rest of the talk on the intravenous anesthetics, barbiturates, propofol, atomidate, and benzodiazepines like diazepam or Valium and their action on the GABA-A receptor. So where are GABA-A receptors located that we are interested in today? They're located on the postsynaptic membrane where they form chloride channels. GABA binds to them, causes an inward flux of chloride, which hyperpolarizes that postsynaptic membrane, making it more difficult for that postsynaptic neuron to fire an action potential. And that's how GABA-A receptors inhibit neuronal activity. I mentioned this before, but they are pentameric ligand-gated ion channels. GABA binds at beta-alpha subunit interfaces. So that's these two circles here is where GABA binds. And then this is their membrane topology again, a large domain that sticks out of the neuron into the synapse where GABA binds, and then four transmembrane-spanning helices per subunit. Okay. <clears throat> So one of the reasons I got so excited about working on GABA-A receptors is my passion for pharmacology and noting that GABA-A receptors have an exceptionally rich pharmacology. There are ligands that bind in the neurotransmitter site like GABA, the endogenous neurotransmitter, mucimol, a high affinity agonist, biculin, a competitive antagonist, benzodiazepines like diazepam or Valium and Xanax, flumazenil, is a benzodiazepine site antagonist. So if one overdoses on diazepam, they will be given flumazenil, and it's like Narcan for opioid overdose, quickly reverses the overdose of benzodiazepines. General uh, neurosteroids also act through GABA-A receptors, and many of these are endogenous molecules. And general anesthetics like phenobarbital, atomidate, and propofol uh, act through GABA-A receptors. J.J. Kim, a very talented postdoc in the lab who now is a scientist at Amgen, did nearly all of the work I'm going to tell you about for the rest of today. So we wanted to obtain structures of the GABA-A receptor at a resolution sufficient to identify binding sites for these general anesthetics. And the way we do that now involves using what we call single particle cryo-electron microscopy. Uh, a simplified workflow here, we have our purified protein sample where we've added the drug to the protein. We put a little bit of it on an electron microscopy grid. We put that sample into the electron microscope and take thousands of pictures. Here's one of these pictures where I've circled some of the GABA receptor molecules. Here is a top view where you may be able to see a little hole in the middle. We're looking down the long axis of the ion channel. Uh, this, this one here is the side view, a little harder to recognize until you stare at these all day, every day. We can then box out these individual particles, images of individual receptors, and align them to each other in two dimensions. And that gives rise to much better signal to noise. And we can start to see this pentameric receptor here in the middle. This is a top view. And then these wings coming off are antibody fragments, fab fragments that we raised against the receptor in order to properly align particles in the cryo-EM experiment to identify which subunit was which in this heteromeric receptor. So here's a top view. Here's a side view. Here's another side view. Once we have cleaned up our data set using this 2D classification, we generate a 3D reconstruction where we align these two-dimensional images in three dimensions. And if this is successful, if we have a very nice sample and nice images, we can get to a resolution where we can build an atomic model into what we call this density map. And the atomic model will have all of our amino acids from our protein structure, as well as ligands that may be bound, like GABA and hopefully general anesthetics. So JJ Kim worked for several years on this project and obtained eight structures that she published in this one massive paper. I will focus on the general anesthetics, as I've mentioned. Uh, those are on the lower row here, and we see in the side view of the receptor, phenobarbital binding, atomidate binding, propofol binding, GABA binds up here, and diazepam down here as well as up here. We'll go into a little more detail on the binding sites before talking about how one of them, propofol, works. So where do they bind? 
So for each of these three anesthetics, I'm showing you the chemical structure and the resolution of the cryo-EM map. For those of you who don't do structural biology all the time, the lower the number, the better. That tells you essentially the fine, fineness of the level of detail in the map. All of these are sufficient for positioning these small molecules. So this is looking at a slice through the receptor structure, through the transmembrane domain portion, and we can see phenobarbital bound here and here, just as examples in the pink density map color. So what we found when we started comparing these structures is that some of these anesthetics, they all bind in the transmembrane domain. They're all greasy molecules. They all partition into the lipid phase. Some of them bind in overlapping sites, like propofol and atomidate bind at identical sites, both at beta-alpha interfaces in the membrane domain. Diazepam binds in these two sites as well. Phenobarbital binds in unique interfaces, predicting synergy between these drugs if one were to take them at the same time. And diazepam actually binds in three sites in the transmembrane domain. So the first step in getting these structures is we love to discover where do they bind. And the next step is going into more detail, validating uh, the findings from the binding sites, and then trying to understand what is the consequence of them binding there. And so we will go through that for propofol as one example. So here is a side view of this electron microscopy map rotating around. So extracellular part, there's propofol bound in the membrane. Uh, we'll come around one more time and we'll see the second copy of propofol bound at the other beta interface that's there in pink. So if we zoom in on that, here's a rocking movie of propofol bound at a beta alpha subunit interface. It has its density map for the ligand shown just for that part to for hopefully convince you that we can be confident about how it fits in there, its position and orientation. We can see what the different amino acids are that make contact with the propofol. And we can test the hypothesis we might have about what are the relative importance of different interactions that the structure suggests. And I'll give you an example of just this asparagine residue right up here in this beta subunit what happens when we mutate it? So here are electrophysiology experiments. They are two electrode voltage clamp experiments in oocytes where we inject RNA for wild type GABA receptor. We apply a low concentration of GABA. We get a small response. We apply the same concentration of GABA plus propofol and we get a big current. So this is what propofol does. It is a very efficacious potentiator of the wild type GABA receptor. When we mutate this residue up here from a small polar side chain that appears to contact propofol, change it from a small polar side chain to a bulky, long hydrophobic residue, methionine, GABA activates. When we add propofol, nothing happens. So it completely ablates the potentiation by propofol, supporting our building of propofol in this site and our conclusion that this is the site through which propofol is acting. Okay, so this is interesting to map binding sites. We enjoy doing this, um, but perhaps more interesting is understanding what is the consequence on receptor activity at the level of structure. And so I'll show you one movie here where we are comparing two structural conformations of this receptor. We will start with just the GABA bound receptor, and then we'll add in propofol, and we will see how the conformation changes. First, we'll look from the side. So propofol binding down here. And maybe you can see there are these very small, subtle conformational changes when propofol binds. But it gets bigger when we look from the top. So this is the ion channel domain. What I want you to notice is that these leucine side chains, when propofol is not bound, they point in toward the ion channel and block ion flow. When propofol binds, that channel opens up widely. This ring of leucine residues here, this hydrophobic ring in the middle of the pore is called what we call the activation gate. When it opens up, ions can go through. So we found when we compared, made similar comparisons among all general anesthetics, that they all do essentially the same thing through acting, when acting through 
different subsets of binding sites. So first, I showed you that we mapped binding sites for these different drugs. Some overlap, some do not. Phenobarbital has a unique site. We have one subunit interface where there is a pocket, but there is no drug bound there. And in fact, we often see density for a long lipid tail that goes right into that binding interface, suggesting that lipids are acting as endogenous, perhaps modulators or structural supports in this receptor, which really should not come as a surprise um, for these membranes, these membrane proteins. So after I showed you binding sites, I showed you this morphing movie where the activation gate opens up in the presence of a representative anesthetic, propofol. And this appears to be how all of these general anesthetics make it easier for GABA to activate the channel. They shift the thermodynamic equilibrium toward the activated state. Okay, so though that is an example of one project in some detail. I'll spend a minute or two talking about uh, where we have been and where we are going. So we have one branch of the lab that works on channel gating and ion permeation. And we had a recent paper characterizing different conformational states of a nicotinic receptor. This is a permeation pathway through it in the activated state. I showed you an example of a structural pharmacology project in the lab where we looked at general anesthetics. And we have a new area of the lab where we are trying to understand how autoimmune diseases work that affect the nervous system. So we were able to obtain antibodies from patients and get structures of them bound to the GABA-A receptors. And these antibodies are causative for autoimmune disease in the brain, GABA-A encephalitis. And the structures taught us something about how the antibodies inhibit the receptor activity and thereby cause disease. I wanted to mention what I think are some major unresolved topics in this field. One is that we have almost no information on allosteric modulators of nicotinic receptors. We know a lot now about GABA-A receptors. The general anesthetic story is just one example, but we don't know much about nicotinic receptors, and these could be important druggable sites. So we're working on that. We would like to get a more comprehensive structural pharmacology of GABA receptors and study their dynamics using confirmation, uh, computational approaches. We want to study diversity in autoantibody mechanisms. Do they all act through similar mechanisms or are there many different ways that autoantibodies bind? And then we want to study receptors purified from native tissue instead of simply making them recombinantly in cell culture. That I think is a big area for the future. So I will end there and thank the people who did the work. JJ Kim, the postdoc on the project, Jin Feng Tang, who did the electrophysiology, excellent collaborators and funding, mainly from the National Institutes of Health. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Ryan, for the fantastic talk. Um, are there any questions now? We have a few minutes from the audience. We have a question from uh, Dr. Shirai Yasu. Yeah, thank you very much for a nice talk. So I have a very uh, one basic question. So I think uh, GABA A receptor is a very uh, popular uh, target of uh, insecticide. So do you know is there any specific region? So there are uh, several types of ion uh, gated ion channels, but uh, uh, among them, the GABA A receptor is a very popular for right. insects. Is there any specific specific region reason? Uh, let's see. So they are popular, I think, because they are so abundant in the brain. I see. So you know. Um, glutamate receptors, ionotropic glutamate receptors are found at half of the synapses in the brain, and GABA receptors, GABA A receptors are found at something like a third of the synapses in the brain. So they are hugely abundant. They are also very heterogeneous. So there are synaptic isoforms, there are extrasynaptic isoforms, mm 
there are 19 different subunits in the GABA A family. And so you can then imagine a huge amount of diversity in channel biophysics, pharmacology, localization at synapses or different places. So I think you know one hope of ours is that if we better understand what the compositions are of these receptors in a real brain and locally in different parts of the brain as well as subcellularly, then we will, well, first it will be interesting from a physiology point of view, um, but in terms of making drugs that have fewer off-target effects, we should be able to really tune specific circuits or only hit certain parts of the brain, avoid others. Okay. That's what we're excited about. Yeah, so yeah. it means uh, uh, it's a benefit, uh, advantage to avoid a side effect or something. Yeah. Yes, definitely. I think yeah. It makes sense. Thank you very yeah. much. Okay, we have Tell a question. Uh, Dr. Fure Yashiki. Yes, so uh, Dr. Hibbs, thank you very much for uh, your elegant work. I'm really impressed by your finding uh, of the activation gate, uh, which is opened uh, yeah. when the propofol binds, uh, perhaps by rotating alpha heresis uh, yeah. forming the pore of the ion channel. Yeah. And uh, my question is, uh, whether that mechanism is universal uh, across different types of channels, uh, not only for uh, nicotinic acetylcholine receptors, but also for voltage-gated uh, ion channels, for example. Ah, uh, sure. So voltage-gated ion channels are completely different. <laughs> their, their membrane topology is, is totally different. And they have, they have a hydrophobic gate um, with a bundle crossing in one area. And then they have a selectivity filter that is in a, in a completely separate location. And from what I understand, that filter can be involved sometimes in different kinds of inactivation. But mostly the gating and selectivity are very different. Whereas in pentameric channels, there is not really a separate gate or filter. And it makes sense because the the role of voltage-gated channels is usually to select among different types of cations. They are all cation channels. Whereas nicotinic receptors, for example, they, are, they do not select among different types of cations. They let through all cations. So they open up very widely. Whereas potassium channels, their gate opens or closes, but the filter always stays very small. Um, and GABA receptors, so there are no activated state structures yet for a GABA receptor. There are some for glycine receptors, but it does look like all of the superfamily, the pores open up pretty wide. So they don't select among different anions, for example. They let through a lot. Um, they only select between cations versus anions. Yeah, really insightful. Thank you very Thank much. You. For Great your question. I see we have one question in the Q&A chat. Um, Dr. Shirai, I don't know if you can, it's in, or we have a couple of questions in, in Japanese. Maybe you can do a translation. Uh, you're muted, Dr. Shirai. <laughs> Sorry. You're so, okay. Ray agonist is uh, used for the uh, 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 similar to the uh, propofol, and uh, but uh, uh, neurosteroid is also used for the partial agonist uh, for the uh, anti-depression. Yes. Yes. So is there right. any uh, relation between the binding site and the function? Yeah, it's a great question. I, I suspect the differences in what happens physio to, a, to your brain um, when you have neurosteroids versus uh, general anesthetics relates to 
subtype selective binding of the of the drugs. So there are so many different subtypes of these receptors. But neurosteroids are incredibly exciting. And there's only one drug available right now that is a neurosteroid for postpartum depression. It's fascinating that levels of endogenous neurosteroids that are positive modulators of GABA A receptors, they go up during pregnancy, they increase. And then when pregnancy ends, the levels of neurosteroids drop quickly. And depending on how high the levels get and how low they go and how quickly they drop, that can precipitate deep depression that's very dangerous. And the only therapy is a 60 hour infusion of one of these uh, neurosteroids. And it's something like 30,000 American dollars for one treatment. So there is a lot of room for improvement <laughs> in developing neurosteroids, neurosteroid analogs. Mm -hmm. It works uh, very well, but it's incredibly arduous to go through the treatment. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, it's, this question is a very nice button to the uh, next a talk, right. I think, because uh, uh, his uh, talk by the Professor Furyashiki is uh, related to the depression. So let's move to the uh, next talk. Is that okay, Itai? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Let me introduce to you Professor uh, Tomoyuki uh, Furyashiki. He is a professor and the chair of the pharmacology at the Graduate School of Medicine, Kobe University. Uh, he graduated and uh, got a PhD from uh, Kyoto University, and uh, he moved to Kobe University in 2014, right? Okay, I think uh, today uh, he will present his work related to the uh, prostaglandin and the uh, depression. Yeah. Yes. Okay, please, Tomoyuki. Hi, so uh, Dr. Shirai, thank you very much for your uh, kind introduction. And so uh, first of all, uh, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Shirai for uh, having me here for this uh, really wonderful international uh, uh, webinar. And the, I'm uh, really impressed by the uh, preceding talk by Dr. Ryan Hibbs about structural biology of ion channels. Uh, I, I, can't believe that um, how sophisticated structural biology, biology can be achieved, and it's far beyond what I can imagine uh, from a, a textbook knowledge. So that's really impressive. Uh, so let me share my slide. So uh, can you see my slide? And uh, there's a pointer on the slide moving on. Yes. Yes, thank you. So uh, let me organize a little bit. Yep. So, so today, uh, uh, as this title says, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, the findings from our lab about inflammatory mechanisms of stress and depression, uh, which is more about systems of neuroscience uh, related to the whole brain circuit and uh, cellular interactions in uh, each of the brain regions. Uh, so that's probably the opposite end uh, of the biology, uh, looking uh, from the, uh, the structure of biology, but I hope that the, this talk will be eventually uh, linked to the very sophisticated structure of biology to uh, fully understand the uh, biology of uh, stress, depression, and many other biological phenomena. So mental illnesses are, of course, are widespread across many countries and impose great burden on our individual life and our society. Major depression is uh, the leading cause of disability in mental illness and e even in all disease categories, counting 280 million people in the world. Further increasing due to COVID-19 pandemic over the last few years and is thought to contribute to our current surge in suicidal death. An important issue in mental illness research is that there are still large population of depressive patients which, who can't be cured with existing treatments. So we medical scientists are hoping to understand the biological mechanisms of depression, which might be exploitable for identifying novel candidates for drug development with new mechanisms. 
for, for this reason, our lab has been studying stress as a risk factor for various stress-related disorders, including depression. Stress uh, is a strain of mental and physical functions caused by adverse and demanding conditions inside and outside the body. One of the critical features of stress is that stress may lead to different behavioral consequences depending on the stress conditions. If stress is brief, predictable, or controllable, it typically induces active and adaptive responses such as fight or flight to cope with stress. On the other hand, if stress is prolonged, unpredictable, or uncontrollable, it could induce passive responses such as depression and anxiety and becomes a risk factor for depression and other mental and physical disorders. Since biological mechanisms of stress remained poorly understood uh, when I started this study, therapeutic development targeting stress pathology has not been really achieved. For that, we need to understand biologically uh, dissociate adaptive and maladaptive consequences of stress to manipulate each of them selectively. To address this issue, we have been using repeated social defeat stress, uh, that is a mouse model of stress pathology, which has been frequently used to study depression. In this behavioral model, an inbred C57 black six mouse or a different strains of mice sometimes is subjected to uh, aggression uh, by an ICR mouse that tends to be aggressive and larger than the other mouse. This social defeat is applied uh, briefly for 10 minutes, uh, once daily for several consecutive days. This repeated stress induces multiple behavior changes, including social avoidance and reduced motivation for reward, which are collectively uh, categorized as depressive-like behavior, elevated anxiety-like behavior, and reduced cognitive performance. To illustrate social avoidance as an example here, uh, we put stress-naive mice, which didn't experience stress at all, or uh, defeated mice, which experienced stress for 10 days, to the open field chambers, uh, where another mouse as a social target was enclosed in the metal meshwork at one end of the field. Red lines indicate the tra trajectories of mouse movements. Uh, naive mice spent most of their time uh, near a social target, whereas defeated mice escaped from the social target and spend most of the time uh, in the opposite corner. To quantify their behaviors, we define the social interaction zone and the social avoidance zone. The defeated mice show an increase in the time for the social avoidance zone as expected. Uh, notably, only a subset of defeated mice shows social avoidance and is often categorized as susceptible mice whereas the remaining mice are as resilient mice. Also, it should be noted that single exposure to stress is often not enough to induce social avoidance to the maximal level, which can be seen after repeated exposure to stress. We can examine the behavior mechanisms by comparing susceptible versus resilient mice or single versus repeated stress. Basic and clinical research over decades have accumulated evidence that mental illness arises from the dysfunctions of neural circuits for emotion and cognition in the brain. There are many brain areas that extensively communicate with each other to generate internal state of our mind and influence our thoughts and behaviors. Among these brain areas, the medial prefrontal cortex, a brain area which is known to be crucial to make an appropriate behavior decision based on external and internal states, shows abnormal activities and structure in depressive patients consistently across uh, many studies. Nonetheless, the molecular and cellular mechanisms for these abnormalities were mostly unknown when I started, uh, when we started to work on this issue. So uh, as monoamines are enriched in the media prefrontal cortex, uh, we first decided to analyze them for stress-induced behavior changes. Just to briefly introduce, dopamine uh, is a neurotransmitter or neuromodulator, and dopamine neurons are mainly located uh, in the midbrain and send their projections to several brain areas. Among these, the nucleus circumference and the medial prefrontal cortex have been implicated in regulating emotional behaviors. These dopaminergic pathways play different behavior roles. For example, the mesocombo dopaminergic pathway projecting to the nucleus circumference um, uh, plays a critical role for motivational behavior to obtain reward and its learning. 
By contrast, the mesal uh, prefrontal dopamine energy pathway projecting to the prefrontal cortex is crucial for cognitive function like behavior flexibility, attention, and working memory. Since around 1980s, it has been known that the aversive stimuli or stressors activate the mesal prefrontal dopaminergic pathway selectively among multiple dopaminergic pathways, but its behavior role remained uh, unknown at the time. So uh, we analyzed the role of dopamine in the uh, repeated social diffuse stress, and we uh, previously found that single and repeated social diffuse stress affects neurons in the medial prefrontal cortex differently. Uh, related to dopaminergic regulation. Briefly, a single exposure to uh, social diffuse stress induces dendritic growth uh, or hypertrophy uh, via a dopaminergic pathway there and suppresses the induction of social uh, depressive-like behavior. On the other hand, repeated exposure to social diffuse stress instead attenuates the dopaminergic function and causes dendritic shrinkage and synaptic loss and depressive-like behavior. Then we wanted to know the mechanism about how chronic stress alters the neural and the behavioral consequences of stress from adaptive side to maladaptive side. As some of you may know, many clinical studies have suggested the association between inflammation and depression pathology. It, for example, it has long been reported that inflammatory molecules such as uh, inflammatory cytokines like uh, TNF alpha and IL 6 are uh, increasing the blast samples and cerebral spinal fluids of depressive patients, even those are medicated patients. Brain imaging studies, uh, which uh, became available later, have suggested uh, inflammation in several brain areas, uh, especially the medial prefrontal cortex uh, of depressive patients. It has also been found that the non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs like celecoxib, for example, that, uh, that are known to inhibit prostaglandin synthesis, augment the therapeutic actions of antidepressants uh, when uh, they are taken together with um, uh, taken together in depressive patients. These findings led scientists to speculate that the inflammation uh, may have causal roles in depression. However, clinical studies alone cannot prove this concept or elucidate the biological mechanism underlying it. Given the clinical findings with non steroid anti-inflammatory drugs, which are known to inhibit prostaglandin synthesis, we first examined the involvement of prostaglandins in repeated social defeat stress. Prostaglandin E2, or PG2, is a species of prostaglandins known to induce uh, so-called sickness symptom when you uh, uh, show the uh, various physical and mental uh, phenotypes uh, upon sickness, uh, including depressive and anxiety-like behaviors. Uh, prostaglandin E2 binds to its receptors called EP1, EP2, EP3, and EP4 for its functions. So we examined the mice lacking uh, each of these prostaglandin E2 receptors. In wild-type mice, uh, as I showed you earlier, repeated social stress induces social avoidance. On the other hand, EP1 knockout mice, the induction of social avoidance uh, completely disappeared. EP2, EP3, and EP4 uh, knockout mice appear normal compared with wild-type mice. In another behavior experiment called the elevated plasmid test to test the level of anxiety, whereas wild-type mice showed high level of anxiety-like behavior by uh, after repeated social diffuse stress, um, EP1 uh, knockout mice failed to do so. These findings demonstrate that PG2 and its receptor, EP1, are crucial for chronic stress-induced emotional disturbances uh, in multiple behavior domains. Then we got interested in how chronic stress activates the PG2 system. So we analyzed the role of cyclooxygenase, which is essential for prostaglandin E2 synthesis. Cyclooxygenase has two isoforms, COX-1 and COX-2, and their localization and functions are different. So we obtained and analyzed knockout mice for each of cyclooxygenases, COX-1 and COX-2. As you see, social avoidance was abolished in COX-1 knockout mice. On the other hand, COX-2 knockout mice didn't show an apparent difference from wild-type mice. In addition, intrapintorial administration of the COX-1 inhibitor called SC560 suppressed chronic stress-induced social avoidance. These results demonstrate the role of COX-1 in repeated social diffuse stress-induced social avoidance. Since COX-1 is selectively expressed in uh, microglia visualized by IBO-1 staining in the brain, we propose that the microglia are the most likely source of prostaglandin E2 in the brain and the repeated social diffuse stress. 
next to investigate the further upstream of prostaglandin A2 production in the brain. In a textbook, uh, cytosol phosphate IPSC2 alpha creeps off arachidonic acid in the membrane from the SN2 position of the phospholipid, uh, and the resultant arachidonic acid is converted to PG2 via cyclooxygenase and PG synthesis. This pathway is primar uh, primarily in many tissues and inflammatory cells like macrophages. However, uh, in the solid organs uh, such as the brain, the endocannabinoid 2 arachidonic glycerol uh, is metabolized by monosoglycerol lipase to produce free arachidonic acid, which are utilized as a primary source of PG2 precursors. To investigate the involvement of this PG2 production pathway, we use the monosoglycerol lipase inhibitor JGA184. JGA184 inhibited the stress induced PG2 production in the brain, suggesting the role of this uh, pyrostaglandin A2 uh, synthetic pathway. Notably, we could uh, detect PG2 increase only in subcortical brain regions, but not in cortical regions, uh, suggesting the unexpected brain region cell activity uh, in stress induced prostaglandin A2 synthesis in the brain. We further investigated whether this uh, prostaglandin A2 production in the brain is essential for the behavior changes. Uh, first, uh, JGA184 uh, inhibited social avoidance uh, almost completely, demonstrating the importance of brain PG2 production for that behavior. Interestingly, however, JGA184 didn't suppress the elevated anxiety at all, and even um, seemingly augmenting uh, this behavior, although uh, PG2 EP1 uh, uh, has been shown to be critical for this behavioral change as I showed you earlier. This result led us to speculate the involvement of peripheral prostaglandin E2 synthesis outside the brain uh, for this behavior, but this is still hypothetical. To briefly summarize so far, repeated socially defeasorous arguments of prostaglandin E2 synthesis in the brain um, via, uh, from uh, two arachidon uh, glycerol, uh, via monoacyl glycerol lipase and uh, microglial cyclooxygenase one in the brain. Although I'm going to skip the data today, uh, we show that this prostaglandin E2 in the brain causes depressive-like behavior by suppressing the activity of dopamine neurons via EP1 receptor. Uh, by contrast, PG, PG, PG2 could also be produced in the periphery, independently from monoacyl glycerolipase, and perhaps a better pathway mediated by cytosolic phospholipase to alpha. This PG2 synthesis could contribute to elevated anxiety via EP1 expressed perhaps in some peripheral cells. So relating to this uh, hypothesis, uh, I'm gonna uh, touching upon the, uh, the po a possible role of myeloid cells, uh, leukocytes uh, uh, in this talk later. Uh, I, I wanna uh, briefly introduce some uh, recent work uh, from David Engblom's lab and his colleagues. Uh, which shows that the EP1 mediated suppression of the dopaminergic system underlies negative emotion induced by sickness, uh, basically bacterial infection model. They found that the LPS and the cytokine called IL1 released into the bloodstream stimulate the vascular endothelial cells, endothelial cells of the brain. Then prostaglandin E2 uh, produced in the brain acts on EP1 uh, and suppress the, uh, the dopaminergic neurons uh, through the stratal uh, inhibitory impulse to there. Uh, and this action leads to the aversion, uh, and the negative emotion uh, to the noxious stimuli. And it, uh, they also show that prostaglandin E2 uh, forced uh, to be released from microglia could mimic uh, these neuronal effects upon sickness. Thus, uh, you can appreciate here that the PG2 mediated attenuation of dopaminergic pathway seems to be a common mechanism converged from social stress and peripheral inflammation, both of which uh, leads to depressive-like depressive and anxiety-like behaviors. Now, uh, the behavior role of inflammatory substances uh, is no longer deniable, yet uh, we didn't know how chronic stress or repeated stress evokes inflammation in the brain and in the periphery, perhaps. And we didn't even have solid evidence that neural inflammation is essential uh, in, in a sense of causality for chronic stress-induced behavior changes. While we studied the roles of prostaglandins and chronic stress, uh, we, we and other labs realized by histological uh, 
markers that chronic social stress induces microglial activation uh, in distinct brain areas, including the medial prefrontal cortex. Uh, several, uh, studies have shown uh, such microglial activation from uh, several laboratories. However, at that point, none of these studies, including ours, addressed molecular mechanisms of the neuroinflammation, nor performed microglia-specific manipulations, uh, thus leaving causal roles of microglia in chronic stress and depression to be demonstrated. So Ron Dumas' lab and our lab uh, independently investigated the molecular mechanisms of repeated stress-induced microglia activation around the same time. We became interested in possible roles of innate immune receptors uh, because many rodent non-neuroscience studies, mostly at the time, suggested their roles in sterile inflammation, uh, which is chronic inflammation, uh, which uh, occurs even without infection. Toll-like receptors, or TLRs, are a representative class of innate immune receptors. They were initially identified as receptors for pathogen-associated molecular patterns. Later, endogenous ligands for toll-like receptors have been identified uh, that are called damage-associated molecular patterns. These ligands are contained usually within the cells uh, in a resting state, but are released from the cells uh, to the extracellular space upon cellular damage or inflammatory stimuli to evoke inflammation uh, via toll-like receptors. To examine the roles of toll-like receptors, we obtained the mice lacking toll-like receptor 2 and toll-like receptor 4, the TLR isoforms uh, that are very associated with neurological disorders like Alzheimer's disease at that time. We subjected them to repeated social defeat stress and examined their behaviors. The mice lacking either TLR2 or TLR4 alone uh, appear to develop social avoidance uh, just as usual compared with wild type mice. However, the double knockout mice lacking TLR2 and TLR4 in combination showed dramatic behavioral abnormalities, as you can see here, lacking social avoidance uh, shown in here. And uh, it, uh, these knockout mice are also impaired in elevated anxiety. Besides, TLR24 are crucial for repeated stress-induced neuronal changes in the medial prefrontal cortex. As I mentioned earlier, the repeated stress-induced the dendritic shrinkage of these neurons in wild-type mice, and this is just quantification. Uh, by contrast, this neuronal change was greatly diminished in the double knockout mice like in TLR2 and TLR4. Since TLR2 and TLR4 are abundant in microglia in the brain, we examine brain inflammation by visualizing microglial activation by histology. In wild-type mice, repeated stress-induced microglial activation in selective brain regions, including the medial prefrontal cortex, uh, in, uh, microglial activation occurred uh, specifically in susceptible mice, which showed the behavior change, but not in resilient mice, uh, which didn't show suggesting a strong association between microglial activation and stress susceptibility. Besides, the microglial activation was absent in the knockout mice, suggesting a, showing a crucial role of TLR2 and 4 for stress-induced microglial activation. To demonstrate the causal role of these microglial activation for the behavior, we invented a method of knocking down TLR2-4 expression selectively in microglia only in the medial prefrontal cortex, uh, where uh, we are seeking for the causal role for the behavior. Uh, here we made a lentiviral vector expressing the artificial microRNAs targeting TLR24 in a query recombinant de dependent manner. Then we injected this viral vector into the medial prefrontal cortex of uh, CX3, CR1, CREA, T mice, in which inducible query recombinant is expressed in microglia. The knockdown of TLR24 in prefrontal microglia by this method abolished social avoidance. Uh, compared with the control condition. Although the data is not shown today, the same manipulation, this uh, TLR2.4 knockdown in prefrontal microglia didn't affect elevated anxiety, uh, which corroborates the possible difference in inflammatory mechanisms for depressive behaviors and anxiety-related behaviors. To summarize so far, we demonstrated that repeated social defeat stress induces microglial activation in the media prefrontal cortex via toll-like receptor two and four. Although I skipped the remaining data, the activated microglia secrete pro-inflammatory cytokines like TNF-alpha and alpha and cause dendritic atrophy and reduced neuronal activity, thereby leading to depressive-like behavior. Uh, currently, we are investigating several remaining fundamental questions related to stress-induced prefrontal remodeling, which I hope to discuss on some other occasion in the near future. <laughs>
as I mentioned earlier, um, our research has suggested the involvement of peripheral prostaglandin to synthesis for stress-induced anxiety-like behavior. So in the last few minutes of my talk, switching a little gear, uh, switching gear a little bit, I'm going to talk about what stress does for peripheral inflammation. This interest has been strengthened by uh, clinical findings for many years uh, that depressive patients show increases uh, in circulating monocytes and neutrophils. Uh, we collaborated with Sumitomo Pharma to address this issue and reported that repeated social defeasters mobilizes uh, myeloid cells uh, such as neutrophils and monocytes uh, from the bone marrow to the circulation. Uh, some of these myeloid cells appear to infiltrate the brain uh, after repeated social defeasters. Interestingly, our neutrophils and monocytes uh, seem to behave differently in a repeated uh, stress model. Uh, neutrophil mobilization uh, seems to be long-lasting after repeated stress. Unlike monocytes, uh, especially the difference is seen uh, after the cessation uh, of stress and uh, after uh, waiting for a week or so. So the neutrophil increase was still maintained uh, one week later. And the neutrophil mobilization uh, is actually more robust uh, in a mouse strain uh, called Bob C mice uh, having a higher stress susceptibility uh, than C57 black six mice, suggesting yet unidentified roles of neutrophil in stress pathology. To pave the way for this question, we pharmacologically manipulated stress uh, induced mobilization of leukocytes. Uh, one of our collaborators, Yoshio Katayama, a hematologist in Kobe University Hospital, demonstrated in his um, uh, great work uh, uh, published in Cell in 2007 that sympathetic nerves uh, play crucial roles in leukocyte mobilization. Later, he showed the roles of beta 2 and beta 3 adrenergic receptors in the bone marrow for that uh, uh, leukocyte mobilization. We systemically treated mice with their antagonists throughout the behavior experiments and found that these antagonists blocked stress-induced uh, leukocyte mobilization. And in behaviors, these antagonists significantly attenuated anxiety-like behaviors induced by repeated social DP stress as measured in elevated anxiety, elevated plasma test. Then we depleted myeloid cells, uh, uh, including neutrophils and monocytes, by treating the mice with uh, the GR1 antibody. Again, this manipulation attenuated the anxiety-like behavior shown here. These findings together suggest that the sympathetic nerve-driven mobilization of myeloid cells is crucial for stress-induced uh, elevated anxiety, uh, if not all stress-related behaviors. How myeloid cells could be involved in the anxiety-like behavior is still under investigation. Uh, for example, uh, John Sheridan's group reported that repeated social stress induces the infiltration of monocytes to the brain, uh, perhaps along the brain vasculature. Uh, we also found that repeated stress causes the accumulation of neutrophils along the brain vasculature and the meninges around in the brain. Notably, this accumulation lasted long uh, for at least several days after the cessation of stress. These findings point to a role of these myeloid cells and effect on the brain, a blood brain barrier integrity uh, for the pathology. Now, let me summarize my today's talk. Our group and others have demonstrated crucial roles of inflammation in stress and depression. Um, However, for many years, we and others uh, seem to have analyzed information as if it were just a single entity. I hope uh, my talk today has convinced you of the existence of, existence of multiple inflammatory mechanisms serving for different biological functions of stress. Briefly, chronic stress induces microglia-driven neural dysfunctions in multiple yet selective brain regions via distinct microglia effectors like prostaglandin, etune, and inflammatory cytokines. This neural information is crucial for stress-induced depressive-like behavior. Besides, stress evokes peripheral inflammation as seen in the mobilization and brain infiltration of neutrophils and monocytes. This kind of information could be preferentially involved in anxiety if its role in depression was not excluded. To employ these rules and findings for therapeutic development, we must further elucidate how multiple inflammatory axes interact with each other and how the interaction causes and stabilizes neural dysfunctions under stress. Finally, I would like to thank many collaborators, especially Drs. Shihu Kitaoka and Xian, former members in my lab, contributed to TLR work, Xian uh, to PG to work, and Yuka Ishikawa, uh, our former grad student, uh, and a research scientist from Sumitomo Pharma, uh, and Dr. Yoshio Katayama uh, to leukocyte work. So uh, thank you very much for your kind attention, and I'm happy to take um, questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tomoyuki. Okay.
it's a time to have a question and a suggestion. Is there any question? Okay, uh, I have one question. So uh, according to your uh, presentation, uh, dopamine and uh, uh, prostaglandin are involved in uh, depression induced by uh, social stress acutely and uh, uh, with a long time. And uh, I thought uh, dopamine is very related to the drug and alcohol addiction. And the addiction is very a chronic uh, phenomenon, a disease. So is there any, any possibility that the prostaglandin E2 receptor, EP1, is also involved in the uh, drug addiction or something? Uh, that's a really good question. Uh, so uh, obviously, uh, EP1 is expressed in uh, straight or neurons, including the ones in the nucleus accumbens, which is kind of center for drug addiction, uh, including alcohol addiction. And uh, we are, our laboratory uh, hasn't uh, pursued the role of the Akumba dopaminergic pathways uh, much, but uh, actually some of the laboratories in the US, like uh, Eric Nessler's group, have reported uh, um, uh, elegant studies uh, demonstrating the, the plastic changes of uh, Akumba dopaminergic pathways and Akumba neurons uh, for repeated stress induced depressive like behaviors. So they also uh, worked on the, uh, the interaction or synergy. Uh, mm -hmm. between the drug uh, dependence and uh, stress-induced behavior changes. And the, uh, the nucleus of combo changes seem to be involved in that interaction as well. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I don't know whether prostaglandin E2 or EP1 receptors is involved in that interaction, but it's possible. And awesome. it's really interesting mm -hmm. to pursue uh, when we think about the potential drug targets oh, okay. uh, to block that uh, interaction. Thank you very much. Itai, do you have a question? Yes. Uh, yeah. Very. Uh, some really fascinating uh, data and ideas there, Tomoyaki. Um, I have a question. The connection between prostaglandins and inflammation and, and depression and stress is really interesting. Has anyone ever looked? Have you or anyone else looked at the effect of maybe diet, like depleting omega six fatty acids from the diet, and thereby does that mediate any of these phenotypes that at least you see in an animal model? Yeah. So. Yeah, that's a lovely question, actually. Yeah, because um, uh, there are several chronicle work uh, suggesting the uh, the positive effect, uh, preventing therapeutic effect of omega three fatty acid containing diet for uh, the depression, and so uh, there are many lipid mediators, uh, not only prostaglandins or arachidonic acid derived uh, lipid mediators, but also omega three fatty acid derived lipid mediators, uh, which are thought to be involved uh, in more like uh, uh, resolving inflammation, uh, calming down inflammation. So it's really interesting to uh, see whether those uh, new class of lipid mediators, uh, which seem to be involved in the uh, inflammation resolution, uh, may play some role in stress and depression context. So we are currently doing uh, so-called lipidomics ana analysis uh, to look at the various lipids, uh, how multiple lipids uh, change in the brain uh, upon repeated stress exposure. And we recently found that the, uh, actually it's not about uh, omega-3 fatty acid, but the uh, some of the lipid called 12 lipoxygenase uh, derived lipid mediators are actually upregulated in the brain only uh, when the animals uh, show the resistance or resilience to stress. So uh, there seems to be some lipid mediators related to uh, stress resilience rather than stress susceptibility. And uh, so it's not uh, necessarily omega-3 fatty acid derived ones, but um, uh, it's really interesting to seek for um, other lipid mediators involved in the uh, stress uh, promotion and stress uh, coping. Okay, thank you. I got a question from Ryan. Ryan, why don't you ask directly? That sounds good. Sorry, I wasn't sure what to do. So I'm curious if there have been any clinical trials or analyses of clinical trials that that would try to connect anti-inflammatories with, uh, with depression. And are there correlations people see in big human studies? Yeah, yeah, uh, definitely. Uh, I, I showed... Uh, one slide in my talk showing okay. the uh, the positive effect uh, yeah. of the non-steroidal mm -hmm. anti-inflammatory drugs, especially uh, celecoxib, 
uh, yeah. in augmenting the therapeutic effect of antidepressants. Uh, but there seems to be the, the difference in efficacy of non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs uh, on, on that effect. So, uh, so we, are, we still, uh, we aren't still sure whether the uh, the prostaglandins are really the key for the uh, the positive effect of celecoxib uh, for the uh, uh, augmentation of antidepressants actions, but yet the uh, prostaglandin is um, uh, a great candidate uh, to uh, connect the non steroid anti inflammatory effects on antidepressants, and also um, uh, there are a couple of uh, open label study. Uh, uh, related to the other NSAs, but uh, the, probably the evidence level is a, a little bit short. And of course, uh, there are uh, lots of clinical trials going on uh, you, uh, targeting the other uh, inflammatory agents like pro-inflammatory cytokines. And the uh, and still the uh, the outcomes uh, are not really convincing. Uh, and we aren't really sure because the uh, the people in this field uh, believe that there is a great heterogeneity uh, in the pathology, the molecular and the cellular mechanism for stress and depression. So uh, one of the uh, the uh, I, one of the uh, the big big ideas in the field is to uh, identify biomarkers to stratify the patients based on the pathology and target a specific population of patients having a, a kind of a consistent pathology to look at them, you know, some uh, pharmacological agents. So that's um, probably the cutting edge uh, type of thought, I think. That's fantastic. Thank you. Thank you very much. Wonderful question. Yeah, thank you very much. So we had one more question from an audience. So is there any relationship between HH viruses and uh, prostaglandin in uh, AAC in uh, cerebellum? I have no idea about AAC. Do you, someone knows knows about AAC? It's uh, I think uh, is it probably is it in the a herpes virus HIV. Uh, I'm a -A -A probably yeah, yeah hepatitis human, virus. Yeah, human hepatitis no, human, virus. Human herpes virus, I think. Ah, okay. Uh, it, it, if H -H -H uh, if I understand correctly, mm -hmm. yeah. So um, I I'm not really sure about the relationship between human herpes virus and depression, but uh, there is some uh, report uh, uh, which tried to connect uh, the uh, some uh, human herpes virus and the depression. Uh, so that's really interesting work. I, I think that was published in iScience uh, some years ago. Uh, but um, uh, uh, as I said, uh, uh, depression is um, a really heterogeneous disorders, uh, mm -hmm. uh, which seems to involve different mechanisms. So probably we have to uh, carefully see uh, whether that finding is really specific to harvest virus or um, the other viruses uh, could be also, you know, um, uh, uh, emerged uh, in con a conjunction with uh, depression and, and try to see whether those uh, or, or which virus uh, may be involved in the pathology. So, but uh, I think the evidence is not a perfectly convincing yet, but definitely it's an interesting avenue to think about. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, today we had uh, two talks uh, by uh, Professor uh, Kuruyashiki and Ryan. So. Uh, let's discuss about uh, our whole story. And uh, actually, it's, we have uh, uh, one question to the uh, Alliance talk. Is there any relationship between uh, amyloid beta and uh, GABA receptor? Sure. Yeah, interesting question. I um, Beta amyloid seems to stick to everything. Uh, it's very hard to work with. I am... My first reaction to studies about beta amyloid binding to proteins we work on is to be very cautious. Um, but it does seem like there's some good work uh, showing that beta amyloid can bind directly to GABA A receptors as well as GABA B, um, or an APP can act on GABA B receptors, which are GPCRs. Um, and when Beta amyloid binds to GABA A receptors, it seems to induce endocytosis. So it down regulates GABA A receptors from the surface of neurons and results in less inhibition in the brain, which could then result in excitotoxicity if you don't have enough inhibition. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Thank you very much. You bet. Yeah. So we have known that uh, brain is very. Uh, uh, 
complex and uh, uh, difficult to understand, but uh, uh, I think it's a very uh, good field to investigate, yeah, for the, our uh, human health. Okay, we enjoyed very much uh, to talk today. Okay, let's close the uh, today's sessions. And uh, uh, Miwako, please. And so, uh, uh, thank you yeah. for uh, Shirai Sensei and uh, Itei for moderating this session. And thank you for uh, uh, Dr. Hibbs and Dr. Furieski for your wonderful talks. And I do hope that this uh, webinar will lead to a collaboration between UC San Diego and Kobe University in this field. Yeah. And I do hope that the audience will uh, stay in touch with us uh, for uh, uh, more um, detailed advanced uh, development in this field. So with that, I'd like to return to Asayama-san for his closing remarks. <laughs>